Welcome everybody to the online seminar series Machine Learning Needs uh, Mathematical uh, Optimization. So we are very pleased to have today uh, Paula Brito. She is an associate professor in statistics and uh, data analysis at the Faculty of Economics um, of the University of Porto. And she is also a member of the Laboratory in Artificial Intelligence and Decision Support uh, at the same university. So Paula um, did uh, her PhD in uh, France at the University of Paris uh, 9th. And uh, she was also um, uh, uh, in a postdoctoral position abroad. And then she returned to um, uh, Portugal. She has uh, expertise in uh, on uh, clustering and uh, analysis of uh, symbolic uh, data. And her work has appeared in renowned uh, journals uh, in the field of statistics and operations research, such as uh, uh, European Journal of uh, Operational Research and Advances in Data Analysis and Classification. She has ample editorial um, uh, service, including journals such as Computational Statistics and Data Analysis. And she has also uh, an ample uh, record of um, um, service to this uh, community and for instance she has been the president of the International Association uh, for Statistical Computing. So we are very pleased to have today uh, Paula give, talking to us about uh, discriminant analysis of distributional uh, data. So for the audience uh, you probably know how uh, we organize things here so if you have very very urgent questions please raise your hand and we will read the question from Paula and otherwise we we, um, we postpone all the questions towards the end of the, the seminar. Thank you so much everybody and uh, the floor is yours, uh, Paula. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dolores. And of course, I would like to start by thanking the organizers, Dolores, Emilio and Christina and other colleagues uh, for inviting me for giving a, a webinar, a seminar in your series. And of course, congratulate you on, on this initiative and this organization. This is really a big success. I've attended quite a few, not all, but quite a few, all these interesting topics, great speakers and very, very successful organization. So congratulations and thank you. And I should start by a disclaimer, as it perhaps was made clear by Dolo's introduction, I am not an optimizer. I have never worked in optimization. My background is in fact statistics and more particularly, more specifically, uh, multivariate data analysis. Uh, I um, used to say that I'm a product of the French school of analyse des données and its tradition. Uh, but my uh, thesis supervisor, long ago, Professor Didet in France, was himself started in optimization and operations research. So the things are connected and it's clear that in data analysis, we do need optimization every pass of the way. So now uh, starting. I know that the title of the talk is somehow a bit provocative. But whether or not you are indeed bored by the usual classical data, the so-called simple numbers, I hope that with the talk uh, can make clear that are, there's something be be beyond the simple numbers that are new uh, perspectives in data analysis. And there's a field uh, of development to be made posing uh, new challenges for us all. If I'm successful at the end, perhaps you'll get new ideas. This work, the, today I'm focusing on discriminant analysis for additional data and we'll soon see what I mean by this. And this is joint work with Sonia Dias from the Polytechnic Institute of Viana do Castelo and Paula Amaral from Nova University of Lisbon. So, uh, sorry, here. This is the outline, so I'll start by some brief uh, motivation for this approach and how it's stemmed by the need to take into account variability in the data. And this led to the development and is now done in the framework of the field of symbolic data analysis. 
Then we concentrate on a specific application, which is a bacterial classification problem, where the data does include um, variability. So once presented the problem, we'll see how we model distributional data, uh, what are the properties, and how um, uh, we uh, take this variability into account. We then proceed to the specific methodology of discriminant analysis, see how we define the linear discriminant function in the pres for distributional data, and, and uh, how we proceed to classification in the case of two groups. We present uh, also some uh, short uh, results of a simulation study that allows understanding how the method uh, behaves. Then back to our biological classification, we see how the method allowed to classify the, the bacteria, the bacteria species uh, in between the two groups of gram positive versus gram negative. And then I finish by drawing some conclusions and pointing out perspectives for further research. So starting. So distributional data, you must uh, have um, started by asking yourself, what does she mean by this? Data that are distributions, what is this? So in what we now call classical data analysis, we are used to the data arrays, to a tables where each case in a row is described by several variables that usually appear in columns. And this may be numerical, uh, or categorical, like here, the number of passengers or the delay of flights or the, the airline or uh, the aircraft, which are categorical. But what if we are not interested in the flights, but we want to analyze the airlines? That is from the flights data. We want to compare, possibly to cluster, to classify that the units of our interest are not individual flights for each of which we have data, but the airlines. Or in uh, other problems of the type, if you have descriptors on purchases made on some uh, ch supermarket chains or department stores, but you are not interested in analyzing the individual purchases, but rather the clients or groups of clients. In official statistics, this kind of problems appear um, quite frequently when you have data obtained on individual citizens, but you are interested in analyzing cities regions or some specific sociological groups. In those cases, data has to be aggregated. Look here at the example of flights. You have data on individual flights, but then if you are interested in the airlines, you have somehow to aggregate the data for each specific airline. Of course, this problem has been there for, uh, for long. What people used to do is to, to comply with the data array model. The aggregation would be done by taking central statistics, by taking mean values, medians, if you want to be a bit more robust, or modes in the case of categories. But then there's a lot of information that's lost. So if uh, we want to keep some more information, and in our case, if you want to keep and then take into account in the analysis the variability that was observed for each of the airlines, then you will aggregate keeping more than just a mean value. And here, we, for instance, for the variable delay upon arrival, we are gathering for each airline the empirical distribution of the delays. And here this would read that in one third of the cases, the delay was below 10 minutes, one third of the cases, it was between 10 minutes and half an hour, and the remaining third, it was between half an hour and one hour. So an empirical distribution. For the case of number of passengers, you see that I the, um, recorded an interval, which can be seen as a special case of an empirical distribution where you consider just one interval defined by the mean and the max. In the case of categories, you can take a dis uh, discrete distribution on the observed categories. And symbolic data analysis is interested in developing models and methods to analyze data as such. That is, to explicitly take into account the variability inherent to the data. For, uh, for us now, the values of the variables are no longer the simple numbers, but they are finite sets 
intervals or more generally distribution on an underlying set of subintervals or categories. That is somehow we went from microdata to macro data to use some terms that uh, stem from uh, official statistics analysis. And this approach has been introduced by Dede back in uh, the end of, of the 80s of last century. In most common applications, in fact, such data that we call now symbolic data arise from the addition of microdata, as in the example that I have just shown. But it also happens that they are often reported as such when you have records for temperature, means and max, variation temperatures within a day or, or a week or a month, in a financial assets daily means and max or open close values, but also directly in descriptions of concepts like descriptions of diseases, of biological species, of technical specifications, where the values given are not constants. The variability is in fact expressed. Also sometimes appear quantile lists like uh, for infant growth, plant measures and the like. So the new variable types that add to the classical numerical single valued and categorical single valued variables now uh, add new cases where you allow for multiple values. And then in the case of numerical data, you also have interval valid variables where an interval of values is recorded or distributional variables where histograms or quantile lists are recorded. And this is where, uh, we, have, where, where we are focusing now. So let's now, uh, given the, this introduction, let's concentrate on a specific problem. Bacteria uh, that, that we are, the bacteria that we are addressing can be classified in gram positive or gram negative. And the, distinct, the distinction between them is that gram positive bacteria do not, do not feature uh, an outer cell membrane that is found in the negative ones, in the gram negative ones. So we have a data set of 23 species of bacteria and we want to classify them according to the frequencies of each nucleotide in the genome. Let's see a bit into more detail. So the complete, we, we rely on data from the complete genome sequences of 11 uh, gram positive and 12 gram negative bacteria, which were downloaded from a gene bank. Of course, you all know now that the genome is the collection of genetic information where the gene is the basic unit um, recorded. And uh, they are expressed the sequences of codons composed by sets of three nucleotides among adenine, cytosine, guanine, or timine. So here are the 23 bacterial species, and you see that for each of which we have several hundreds or thousands of genes recorded. So for each bacteria, for each species of bacteria, there's a lot of uh, information, which is of this type, like one gram positive and one gram negative. You see for each of which you have for more than 12,000 genes. So the, the data is like this. For each species, a large number of genes is available, is present. For each gene, the full gene sequences is given, which is a series of codons, so three uh, the three uh, nucleotides, uh, adenine, timine, guanine, or cytosine. And what our uh, biologist colleagues record and are interested and think that that is related to the classification of bacteria into gram positive or the gram negative, it's the percentage of each of the nucleotides, the percentage of A's, T's, C's, and G's. So this is the data that we have. But remember, we are interested in classifying the species, not the genes. So for each species, there's a lot of information that has to be aggregated so that we have a direct an aggregate description of each species that would allow then uh, to proceed with classifications. So what we'll do is that for each species we uh, will will be described by the distribution of the frequencies of each nucleotide a c g or t 
So we have four variables, which are distributional variables. And the empirical distribution of the frequencies is recorded for each species. And this is the, the main study. But remember that the gene sequence is in fact a series of codons of three nucleotides. We also considered a more uh, refined study where we considered the distribution of the frequencies of each nucleotide separately in the first, second or third position. So taking not just the global frequency, but the frequency in each of the positions of the codons and then compare the classification results based on this data. So uh, now that we understand that to solve our problem, we have to take into account the distribution of uh, some variable here, the frequencies of the nucleotides, um, we have to know how we will model this distributional data and how we can define a discriminant function uh, to then classify the bacteria. So we proceed to the third point, where we address the modeling of distributional data, numerical distributional data in our case. So we need to see how we represent numerical distributional data, and this will so-called histogram valid variables. Then we'll define how uh, we make a linear combination of such distributional valid variables and on the basis of which we present a discriminant method for the distributional data, and finally, classification rules to assign observations to one of the two groups. Histogram value variables mean that the observation of each unit, in our case, it will be each bacterial species, it comes in the form of a histogram. A histogram, like we have learned in our first statistical course, a series of sub intervals of non overlapping sequence, uh, sequentially consecutive sub intervals, each of which assigned a weight and the weight set up to one. So just the standard histogram. And if we assume a uniform distribution, as is usually done within each sub interval, then this, this histogram may also be represented by means of the associated quantile function which, because of the uniformity hypothesis, is just a piece, piecewise linear function. And then you may ask yourselves at this point, why would she go from the histogram to a function, and why the quantile function, which is the inverse of the cumulative distributional function, and not the distributional function directly? Well, we take a, a function because, remember, we have to operate with them to define linear combinations uh, in particular and to define uh, classification rules. And it's much easier to operate and to have an arithmetics for functions than for histograms. Everything is well defined and we know how to operate with it. Then, remember, we are in a multivariate setup. We want to make linear combinations of the functions. So it's appropriate to use the quantile functions because they are all defined in the same domain, which is the unit interval between 0 and 1, which is not the case for the cumulative distribution functions. So we'll work uh, with the quantile functions as a way to represent the empirical distribution. And here is an example for the first variable distribution of the frequencies of nucleotide A uh, a in the, the Staphylococcus aureus uh, species. Here is the observed histogram, as you can see, with four so intervals which are defined by the quartiles. And here is the associated quantile function, a piecewise linear function. Here you have the graphical representation, the histogram, and the quantile function. And as you see, you, you look at this histogram and you are perhaps thinking, this is not how I remember a histogram. Usually the rectangles have different heights. Well, you can, uh, when you aggregate the individual data, you can either fix the subintervals and then have random weights, or fix the weights, fixing some predefined set of quantiles, and then the lower and upper bounds of the subintervals will be random. And this is what we have done here. And the reason for this is, again, an operational one. 
because then the, the quantiles that you choose to define the subintervals of the histogram will be the limits of the different branches of the piecewise linear quantile functions. And it helps, of course, to have all functions decide, defined with the same branches on the same subdomains. Okay. Now, to, we do need uh, a distance, a measure of, um, uh, of difference of how to quantify the difference, the distance between two such distributions. With the real numbers, it's easy. You just take a difference or a square, dis uh, a, a square difference. But if you are distributions, how are they to be compared? Of course, there are many uh, measures in the literature for distances between functions or between density functions, between distributions in general. We shall rely on the Malo's distance, given two quantile functions that represent distributions and distributions or intervals, but we shall take intervals as a special case. Then the Malo's distance is defined as the square root of the integral over the unit interval of the square difference between the two quantile functions. If we do assume a uniform distribution within the intervals, then it's easy to, to see that this uh, Malo's distance this, uh, is just the squared Malo's distance is just the sum, the weighted sum of the Euclidean distance between the centers of the subintervals and the weighted distance between the half ranges of the subintervals. So very easy to operate with, in fact. And this is the result obtained by some Italian colleagues. Now, given that we have a distance, we have a means to obtain a central distribution, a barycentric histogram, which will be just the distribution or the quantile function represented by a quantile function, the barycentric quantile function that minimizes the sums of square uh, Malo's distance to all of the observed ones. And this is in fact, just a quantile function where centers and half ranges are the classical means of the centers and half ranges of all the given observations. Importantly, the Malo's distance and the barycentric histogram or barycentric distribution allow for the Huygens theorem that uh, presents the decomposition of total dispersion around the barycenter in between groups and within groups dispersion. A decomposition that is the basis for many methods in multivariate data analysis and particularly in discriminant uh, data analysis. Now, we need to define a linear combination of quantile functions. Remember, we are looking for a method for linear discriminant analysis. So, a linear uh, combination of the quantile functions. And of course, the most straightforward way would be just to make a linear combination, as, as a simple linear combination of the observed functions for the different variables. But this is not the way it should be done. And why not? Because the space of quantile function is not a linear space, it's just a semi-linear space. Quantile function is not just any type of functions. They are non-decreasing functions. They are the inverse of the, of the cumulative distribution functions. So they are non-decreasing function. Therefore, if you multiply a quantile function by a negative coefficient, you obtain a decreasing function, which could never be a quantile function of any distribution. It's not a linear space. A way out would be to impose non-negativity constraints on the coefficients, but then you would be imposing a very particular kind of linear combinations where only direct um, linear relations between the outcome, the scores, and the observed uh, variables would be allowed for. And this is also a restriction that nobody wants to, to impose on their models. Uh, with some ideas, a proposal has been uh, presented to address the semi-linearity of the space of quantile functions, and this has been successfully applied to regression problems. What does this consist in? It consists in considering in the linear combination two terms by explicative variable. So for each explicative descriptor, for explicative variable, each descriptor, there are 
two terms in the linear combination. One that represents directly the quantile function of the observed data and uh, of the observed histogram, and one which is the quantile function of the symmetric histogram. And with two terms per variable in the linear combination, we can now impose a non-negativity constraint on the coefficients and still not impose a direct relation. It may be assured that there is no multicollinearity problems because these functions, the, the quantile function representing histogram and the quantile function representing the symmetric histogram are generally not collinear. Okay. Of course, this double the numbers of coefficients to be estimated. Sorry. So now we may proceed to discriminant analysis. We know how to um, how to define a barycenter, and we know how to define a linear combination of quantile functions. Here is with a parallel of what we are all used to, the classical model for linear discriminant analysis, and how we set up when you have distributional data. So the linear discriminant function in the classical setup is just a simple linear combination of the observed real valued variables. In our case, the discriminant score will also be defined as a linear combination in the way we have just defined of the quantile functions of the observed and the of histograms and their corresponding symmetric histograms with non-negativity restrictions on the coefficients because of the semilinearity of the space of quantile functions. Then, to obtain the coefficients in classical discrim linear discriminant analysis, we rely on the decomposition of total dispersion around the, the mean in between and within matrices of sums of squares between groups and within groups. The same can be done because of the Eugen's theorem that allows for the same decomposition. And therefore, the quadratic form uh, uh, gamma transpose T gamma that uh, will uh, the quadratic form based on the total dispersion can be decomposed in the sum of two quadratic forms with the between and within matrices. The same applies now in our in our case. The same decomposition is valid. The T, B and W are now 2P times 2P matrices. Is P is the number of descriptors because Remember that for each variable, we have two terms in the linear combination. To obtain the coefficients gamma for the linear, uh, the optimal discriminant linear combination, we maximize the ratio of the two quadratic forms between uh, considering the between and the, the within sums of squares. In our case, we shall also maximize this ratio of quadratic forms, but now with non-negativity restrictions on the coefficients. And what in the classical case is just a straightforward optimization problem to solve is now a hard optimization problem. It's convex, it's easy to find a solution, but difficult to prove optimality. And here is where we really need it. Um, optimizers knowing what to do. To solve this optimization problem, we rely on conic optimization and rewriting the optimization problem uh, in uh, this way here, where using the cone of completely positive matrices and relying on the work by Paul Amaral, Manuel Bons and Judith on copositivity and constrained fractional quadratic problems. And this has allowed to solve the problem. The final uh, step is to have a rule for classification in the two groups. And for this, we rely on a distance-based rule on the Malo's distance. So uh, an observation that is in our case, a species of bacteria in, in the application will be assigned to the group for which the Malo's distance between the, its score and the score of the barycentric histogram is minimum. So distance-based uh, classification. We have um, developed a simulation study 
to understand how uh, this uh, method uh, behaves. And for this, we have considered histograms based on data uh, simulated according to different distributions, uniform normal, log normal, to have some uh, skew distribution and also a mixture of distribution. We have considered different levels of separation between groups based on mean and standard deviation to be similar or different. Consider three descriptors, two groups, which should be balanced or unbalanced in the learning sets, small uh, cardinals uh, in the or, or larger groups. If for the test sets, even larger groups, again, balanced or non-balanced. And just summarizing the simulation studies, here are some graphics uh, of the heat rates in the test set. Uh, for the balanced and the non-balanced uh, case. And we see, of course, when the mean, when both the mean and the standard deviations are similar between groups, the problem is much more, di much more difficult. Uh, when at least one of them is different, the results are quite good. And some summary of the simulation results, similar for the four different uh, distributions considered in general increasing the difference between means and standard deviations of course provides a better discrimination as would be expected in the learning sets the mean of the heat rate is slightly higher for large samples uh, in general the percentage of well classified observations is influenced similarly by differences in the mean and in the standard deviation in the skewed case of normal distribution, we saw that when the mean of the two groups is quite different, the increase in perturbation in the standard deviation is not really uh, helping uh, much more. And then back to our bacteria. So we remember that in case one, we wanted to classify the bacteria in this gram positive or gram negative from the global distributions of the frequencies of the four nucleotides, the ACTG, where, whereas in case two, we had three uh, sub uh, studies where we considered the frequencies of the nucleotides, but just in the first, in the second, or else in the third positions of the codons. In each case, we have the 23 bacteria. It's more or less balanced groups. We have aggregated the data from the individual genes in histograms uh, with four subclasses with a free constant frequency of 25%, like you saw in the small example I showed before. Uh, the 23 species were considered to obtain the parameters and then leave one out cross-validation was applied to obtain the parameters of the linear discriminant function, barren optimization method was applied. And here are the results. When the global frequencies are considered, we obtain a heat rate of 78% with leave one out. And uh, there are five out of the 23 species of bacteria which were uh, misclassified and which, according to our uh, bio biologist colleagues, are the most difficult ones to classify. When only the first, the second, or the third position in the codons are considered, the results are slightly worse. But we notice that it is the first position that better codes the information about the type of bacteria, of bacteria species. The here below is the expression of the linear discriminant function. The score is a quantile function, a quantile function that is a linear combination of observed quantile functions. For each variable, we have two terms. And we notice here, uh, it's completely by chance, that you have a repetition of coefficients. But, uh, but this need not be the case, of course. Also, uh, do not uh, be misled by the fact that you have minus signs. The coefficients must all be positive, but here the quantile function is written not as a function of t, but as 1 minus t, and therefore the, the minus sign appears. Okay, Just a way of writing. So finally, drawing some conclusions and perspectives. So with this kind of approach, uh, we went to from the classical, the recorded micro data to macro or aggregated data. 
and considering distribution value data where an empirical distribution is observed and is recorded for each unit, which takes a special case when we have interval valid data. And this allows to take variability into account in the representation and analysis. In our applications, we used histogram data, and for this kind of data, the proposed methods are based on the Malo's distance between quantile functions. I did not stress this, but in case you have um, degenerate distributions when the values are indeed constant, then the Malo's distance is nothing more than the Euclidean distance. That's the standard, so we go back to standard methods and standard measures as a special case. Uh, we have proposed a discriminant, linear discriminant method for numerical distributional data relying on linear combinations of quantile functions of the observed histogram, histograms. The performance was evaluated by means of a simulation study with different setups and then applied to the classification of bacteria into a priori groups. Uh, what is on the table? For the bacteria classification problem, we already do have a much larger data set, much more than the, just the 23 species that is being processed. We have to study the effect of degradation granularity, that is, we have chosen to aggregate the microdata from the thousands of genes into two sub intervals for each histogram, but we could have considered just one interval or a different number of sub-intervals, four or five, and so how what how do this impact the the classification results is something that should be addressed. addressed. <clears throat> of course, the whole methodology is to be extended to more than two class problems by considering either uh, one versus one or one versus all strategies. And then the next step is to go from histograms to estimation of densities and define the whole methodology for uh, densities. And this is the PhD of Rui Nunes, a student that is starting now to work with uh, me and Sonny Diaz. Because, of course, this is an open field, there are new problems which present new challenges as distributions are not real numbers. Standard properties may not take been taken for granted and many things have to be readdressed. But already in the 80s of last century, Schweizer was saying that distributions are the numbers of the future. And this is, of course, the case in the era of big data. Uh, before I finish, I'd like to take this opportunity to draw your attention to the conference that we are organizing in Porto next summer. This is the 17th Conference of the International Federation of Classification Societies under the motto of Classification and Data Science in the Digital Age. And of course, you are all invited to, to come, to submit and to come. Uh, I should say that most of the works I've seen presented in this webinar series fit very well to the conference. In particular, there is a special track on optimization in classification and clustering. And among the publications, they will have pre-conference proceedings with Springer, but post-conference special issues and uh, highlighting uh, the, Euro, uh, the special issue of the Euro Journal of Computational Optimization on modern optimization approaches to classification. And you'll find us on the conference uh, web page. I hope to be able to welcome you all in Porto next summer. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be more than happy to answer some questions, should you have some. Thank you. Thank you, Pavla, very much for your uh, interesting presentation. And uh, really good to see also the, the conference um, and, and the invitation to uh, the audience uh, here. Um, are there any questions for uh, Paula? And you know that if you raise your hand, uh, we will um, um, give you the right to. Um, yeah, unmute. I have noticed that Paula Maral, who is co-author of this work and, and really supported us in the most optimization problems, is also uh, online. So, uh, if there are questions specific to the optimization uh, method applied, she perhaps can can also intervene. Hmm. Um, I have um, a question, but um, 
you have to forgive me because it's not my expertise, but uh, when you show um, these histograms, um, is it the level of granularity uh, of the representation of the data? Is it given or, or is it something no, that you no. can it's, it's, manipulate? It's a user choice. It's a user choice. It's not given. I mean, unless someone imposes, but in principle not. So this, and it will impact the results. So this, this is in this particular application, it has to be studied. But we know that considering a histogram with more classes or just an interval will, will make a difference. Of course, you cannot have many subclasses if you have not many uh, observations. In this case, this would not be a problem because you had thousands of genes for each species. So we really could consider more than four subclasses, say five or even 10, and this still there's a lot of observation that histogram makes sense. And, and to understand how this impacts the results is, is of course of interest. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, are there um, any questions from the audience? I think um, well. it was all uh, clear. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, people, I, I mean, I would be happy to, to engage in some discussion if people have questions later on after yeah. seeing the slides or the, the video and, and you know, can write. Yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. You know that uh, a lot of people uh, later on go to the YouTube channel and uh, yeah. watch it. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Paula, for uh, this very nice presentation. And thank you for the audience for uh, uh, coming back. And um, see you uh, next week uh, with um, our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you everybody. very much for this nice thank invitation you. again. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's here. Thank you.